So you will see Muslims with all different types of uh, headdress. <laughs> so, so you will see men wearing, uh, we call this a kufi. Uh, some people call it different things. Um, and sometimes you'll see turbans of many different colors. <laughs> um, and of course you see that uh, the Muslim women, they wear the, the full head covering. So for the men, again, Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him, he used to cover his head when he would go out in public. Um, uh, I mean, but there were times where he didn't. I mean, it's not like an obligation to do that. Uh, but it's seen as, some would say, like a, a way of showing humbleness before God, but also respectfulness and dignity. Um, so it is something, again, that you will see a lot of Muslim men doing sometimes, but it's not obliga obligatory. Uh, it's, it's a little bit different because it's more than just a religious symbol. It's, it's kind of like we're trying to emulate Prophet Muhammad's style also. So, um, but yeah, it's a, a interesting observations. Any other questions and we'll wrap up, inshallah. Yes. Oh, were you going to ask? Okay. Ladies first, right? Okay. Yes. Okay. So uh, the question is a little bit about my background. Um, so uh, as, as you've already uh, deciphered, uh, my parents came from Egypt. Uh, I was born in Arlington, Virginia. I was raised here in Austin, Texas. I uh, went to Matthews Elementary, Martin Middle School. Are you from Austin? No, okay, so you don't know these things. Some of you know. Uh, Austin High School, but then I transferred to Pflugerville, graduated a Panther, then I went to UT. Uh, Longhorn. Uh, then uh, my degree, uh, a lot of immigrants, they only have two choices, either be a doctor or an engineer. So I chose, I uh, wanted to be an engineer. I worked a little bit as an engineer, didn't like sitting in a cube. Uh, this was part of my life actually growing up to be active in the community. So uh, in 2003, I decided to pursue this full time. So I served as imam in uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, uh, which is a very nice place. Um, once you get past the Osama comments, but yeah, it's a very nice place after that. Um, and then uh, I came back here to Austin uh, and been serving as imam. So in terms of the qualifications, if, if that's part of your question, basically to be an imam, you need to know uh, the Qur'an, uh, either the entire Qur'an or a sufficient amount of it to like, lead the prayers, because in the prayers, you're reciting from memory the Qur'an. Uh, also, you should have, it would be good to have a command of the Arabic language and, and uh, knowledge of hadith. In America, we don't really have a formalized system for graduating imams. There aren't any full-blown seminaries. There are a few starting, uh, but of course, if you're in a Muslim country, then there's a whole system where you start from a young age, uh, memorizing Quran, then learning this, learning this until you graduate. So for me, it's, it's been an interesting journey. I'm, I'm enjoying it even, even till today, so yeah. All right. So I don't want to end on a question about myself. Any other questions? Okay, here. Oh, did you have, did it, we didn't, there you go, here's, yeah. I was curious, uh, being that there's no divinity attached to messengers. What yes. behind the sort of divinity nature of portraying Muhammad? And is it similar with other prophets? Yes. Um, so the question was, if there's, if the prophets and messengers are not divine, so why is there such a taboo or actually the, prohibition on displaying their image. So it's precisely because of the fear of people taking them as divine. Initially, that's what the reason was. Uh, because, again, think about what the latest manifestation of Islam ca came out of. It came out of a polytheist system where uh, statues of various people were made, and then eventually they became seen as deities. And so to have an image, uh, whether you know, a picture or, or statue, uh, it may eventually lead a person to, be, to direct in their heart a worshipfulness towards that image, right? So that's, that's the sensitivity about it. Sometimes you will see uh, some old uh, kind of uh, paintings, but those are more for like teaching, and they usually have like this white veil over the Prophet Muhammad's face. I haven't seen it myself, but as far as I understand, there's a statue of Prophet Muhammad at the Supreme Court of the United States as one of the lawgivers, right? So that's very interesting. That should be on Fox News tomorrow. Oh, new discovery, inside scoop. We got it. The Muslims put a statue of their prophet. They're trying to take over. All right, anyway. 
uh, this is the last question, and so right. yes. Uh huh. Is, is any of that uh, any any of that connected to the tensions or anything? The disagreement between the two groups there. So the question is, uh, the differences uh, that might be sectarian, such as Sunni and Shia, does that have to do with the violence? Uh, yes and no. I think it's an excuse. Uh, whenever there is tensions um, over uh, political or territorial issues, then people will resort to those sort of identifications um, to to see the other as the other, meaning that a person who is, let's say, a Sunni who is killing someone just because he's Shia, or Shia who is killing someone just because he's Sunni, if you actually go and talk to them, they know very little about their own belief. <laughs> but it's, like, it's more like, uh, like the McCoys, what were they called? In the Huckleberry, Hatfields and the McCoys? Was that in Huckleberry Finn or what was that in? Was it Huckleberry? Yeah, feuding. I'm trying to remember my, my uh, public education uh, here in Texas. So um, for the most part, it's just because there's like a tension. And people like begin to group on identification levels, right? So if, if they really go to the core of their teachings, then they wouldn't be uh, using violence towards one another. The, you know, the very most they would do is be debating one another to try to prove each one another through discourse, right, in a respectful way. All right. Well, thank you all for, for coming. We will continue this uh, next week. I think you found your way uh, today. So we'll continue uh, next Wednesday at 7 o'clock looking at the first, pil the first pillar of practice in Islam, which is testimony of faith. Uh, thanks, and have a, a safe drive home. As-salamu alaykum.